thank you, Doug, and also thank you, Melina, for inviting me uh, here to talk to everybody. I funny story is that I originally signed up for the CEO Works Group, and um, just to come to last month's meeting, it was very last minute, and I missed it anyway. Uh, but I was kind of waiting for the response in my application, and Melina reached out and was like, "Oh, do you want to talk to the group?" Uh, for November, which was kind of a surprise because I guess that means I'm in the group. <laughs> but it was uh, it worked out anyway, and this is a, a great opportunity to meet everybody um, and learn about your businesses um, as well. So again, my name is Monty Atherton. Uh, I have a small design studio called Astonishing Work. We work on uh, brand identity, packaging, um, and experience design, uh, and we always try to solve people's business problems through creative design solutions. Um, and I've also been an entrepreneur in the past. Uh, you can see here, Mr. California was a brand that I had um, uh, helped revive with a friend. Um, and so I always take those entrepreneurial experiences to the table when I'm looking at design problems. Um, so I hope that gives me a unique um, uh, perspective when I do that. And today uh, we're talking about the value of design. Um, and it's interesting, the value of design has been one of these things that for um, most of the history of time, there's been no real quantitative data put to the value of design until um, quite recently where uh, uh, the Design Management Institute um, had done a study in 2015 and they looked back at uh, 16, or they looked at 16 design-centric companies and compared them against the rest of the S&P 500 um, over a 10-year span. And what they found was not only were revenues higher um, and shareholder returns higher, but uh, customer retention, um, customer engagement, all was um, increased with these design-centric companies. <clears throat> so what is design? Um, and design is interesting. We talked about this early. It's kind of a suitcase word. Um, you know, design, if we ask everybody in the room, what is design, there's probably 10 different answers. Um, but uh, really, basically, it's creative problem solving. Um, and, and when you use that within businesses, it's, it's usually trying to solve business problems that you have. And so how do we know whether we're, um, you know, looking at good design? Like, how do we evaluate design? And we basically use these principles um, when looking at any design problem. It could be about a product. Uh, it could be customer service. Um, it could be your app. Um, whatever you're looking at, and you're hoping to, f to, to get to a point where it's aesthetically pleasing, it's clear and concise, um, it's engaging, and people want to actually use your product and come back to it. Um, and uh, versus, you know, bad design, which is often pretty recognizable. You're just like, it's icky. Um, you don't want to use it. It's often people will try a, an app out if it's ugly and, and put it down and never come back to it because it's not engaging. It's not a space they want to be in. And so <clears throat> this leads me to like how design trends have changed over time. And in the last 10, maybe even 15 years, there has been a lot of um, awareness to design, designer, entrepreneurs, like creating and starting businesses. And it's created a much more competitive marketplace. So at one point in time, you may have been the, um, the product in your space because you spent money on design and all these efforts. You might have been the easy standout. But as, as people are more and more aware of the value they're putting money and efforts into it, and it's, it's kind of leveling that playing field, and it's creating more competition. So you have to like actually try harder to differentiate yourself from other products and services. Um, and, and, and that's a, a, a really big um, change in the market. And then also, uh, design has become more analytically driven. So um, in the way 
you know, business and a number of people, numbers people have done it in the past. It's always about showing results. And more, there are more tools that have engaged um, different parts of the company, uh, anywhere from like your sales team, your CRMs can tell you how your sales team is doing. Um, we can do things like that now uh, with things like, for example, the uh, Google ads and the ability to A-B test ads to take a bunch of headlines, uh, take a bunch of images, mix and match, and see like really what starts to work and connect with people um, and hone in on that messaging with your clients. Um, so it's, it's analytics in that way. Um, it's also analytics in the way of um, product testing. Uh, the, you might have a product that you put out in the market and the cycles have gotten much tighter where you release a product you get the analytics and then you feed that back into your product so that your, your loop is tighter um, and you're, you're trying to achieve uh, more of what the, the user or customers desire from those products through those analytics. So that continuing iterate, iterative process has become more standard within companies. Um, like Adobe Creative Cloud, like Adobe Photoshop, it used to be they release what Ted like once every two years or so a product, and then like once a year they do kind of a a, a minimal release. Um, now <clears throat> with Creative Cloud, it's it's kind of ongoing and continuous. You really only notice when the updates come in, uh, either when you're asked to push the button to make the update, or when they have a, a feature that actually uh, addresses a specific need you have, and then you're like, oh wow, they've made this update, but but beyond that, it's become more of a seamless interaction with, with you and the product. Um, and then it's interesting, like when you look at the customer journey, um, design trends have turned into um, a, a, a thing where you have different touch points that you're going to engage with um, in any product or service. So it might start in the marketing. Um, and the person learns about your product, uh, and let's say you're lucky enough to actually decide to buy your product, um, and, and knowing that those touch points are still cohesive and connective. And then let's say your product is actually attached to an app so that you can use your product. Um, I like to use this example, like we have this uh, product called the Jewel. It's like a sous vide thing for the kitchen. Anybody? In the... it's, a, for, it's a cooking tool. <laughs> you put it in a bath of water and you make, make the water hot and you can cook food to a very specific temperature. But it relies on an app to actually run the product. It, the product does nothing without the app. <clears throat> and those touch points from marketing to product to that app, is it cohesive and, and are all of those touch points still, do I still feel like it's the same product from the unboxing of this product to actually making the settings on this cooking device. And then they'll engage their, their customers. They send out emails that are, um, that they'll talk about recipes or new cooking techniques. And so then you might visit the website and there's another touch point and another, another spot where design is important. Is it cohesive and clear? And is this ecosystem all held together? And that extends into customer service. You know, the, maybe this product is really great, but when you pick up the phone and you have a question, is it still something that is, um, are, are they still handling you the way that the marketing was speaking? Or is it still friendly, informative, clear, and engaging? And, and this has all become um, that much more important uh, alongside the competitiveness <clears throat> with products in the market. And then, of course, everybody's talking about AI. And I won't go deeply on it here, but AI is definitely changing design and design teams. Um, my personal experience uh, with AI, there's a lot of great stuff that can come out of it for quick V1 ideas. Um, in the early design part of the design process, we're trying to generate a lot of, uh, a lot of design thinking. And, uh, a big portion of that I find is just trying to get past the cliche, the obvious stuff, right? And get into the good, the good nuggets, like the sort of forethinking creative bits. And AI can help teams to speed up that process of getting through those first stages. Um, 
It also is helping to speed up production in a number of areas. Um, there are tools coming online that are taking tasks that used to take days, if not weeks, and turning them to quick minutes. Uh, Ted had shared a tool a couple of weeks ago, I think, of taking still images and painting over areas and putting motion into like water, like a boat sitting on a lake and the water just, it moves. And it's, it's really impressive. And that's stuff that used to take much more effort, much more time. Um, and teams leveraging that are, are, are um, starting to get advantages of that or take advantage of, the, of that. Um, and then just the quality of output, I think, is, is, is leveling up because of the early stage iterations and the assistance that, that um, AI can help with. Um, but AI is, is pretty interesting, and it's, it's fascinating to watch uh, the market and, and jobs change right in front of our eyes in just a few short months. So now I want to walk through a couple of um, case studies of clients that we work with um, where I feel like they had a, a business problem and through design, uh, we got some pretty impactful results. And the first one is a company called Lioko. Uh, they are a family winemaker. Uh, they don't actually grow their own grapes, so they're not a vineyard. Um, but they've turned that into an advantage. <clears throat> they have about 20 different wines that they make now. Um, and they all come from uh, mostly Northern California, but from different vineyards. They really hunt out uh, vineyards that have special kind of growing situations where the vines are stressed or um, they'll, they'll uh, buy grapes like that might have a unique varietal that's not super common. And so they've turned that that part of their business into essentially their tagline, wine from special places. And so Lyoko, um, for years, I mean, they're, they're almost 20 years old now. Um, they've been making this wine called the Sonoma County Chardonnay. And uh, it's kind of a flagship product of theirs. People love it. Um, but it mostly had been sold in uh, restaurants. Uh, in small boutique wine shops. So it, it was out there, but it, there wasn't a lot of it out there. And they really wanted to leverage <clears throat> the, the um, people's love for this wine and um, it also being a price point within their, their lineup. Um, they wanted to leverage that and get it into grocery stores. So they started um, the sort of sales process trying to get into the grocery stores and and uh sort of the big win for them was to get into whole foods and anybody that's ever tried to get a product into a grocery store let alone whole foods would know that it's incredibly uh fiercely competitive and um they were lucky enough to find a liaison inside whole foods that really loved the product and was just honest with them and was like we love the product but the packaging is dated, you know, on the shelf, it just doesn't cut it. And um, so Lioko took that to heart and approached us and wanted to find a solution to come up with some better packaging. So we took the wine, the idea of wine from special places and um, a really, one thought we had is just the, the graphic impact that topographic maps ha have. They kind of tell a story very quickly. You see a topographic map, you know we're talking about a, a space or a place. And so we, we applied these maps to <clears throat> each of the wines in the, in the lineup, um, and each map is relevant to where the actual grapes are coming from. And when we showed these um, to Whole Foods as, as a product family, uh, they were super excited about the the, the bold impact that they had on the shelf, and they felt like it actually met the same level of the wine in the <coughs> bottle. So um, they placed their first order. Um, this is a few years ago now, and uh, Whole Foods is still carrying their wines. Um, so this is a huge win for them. 
Whole Foods was, was sort of the pinnacle, but they also got into like Gus's Market up in San Francisco and a number of different place, uh, uh, grocery stores and shops that, that they'd really want to be in for a long time. And by doing so, um, it allowed them to um, double their lines. So when they first engaged with Whole Foods, they had two different wines that they were selling. Um, but with the extra income and sales, they were able to double it to four, um, which has just helped them grow year after year in sales on top of expanding the product line. So, um, you know, obviously the financial change for the company, it took a lot of heat off of them and they're in a much more comfortable situation to run the rest of their company. Uh, their tasting room, um, they're in Healdsburg, uh, their tasting room now often gets people that have enjoyed the product from Whole Foods and they hunted them down when they came to California. So it's like expanded the market in ways that they didn't even expect, um, which has been pretty exciting for them. Hello, welcome. Then the next uh, client project I'd like to talk about is shooter detection systems. And just like it says in the name, it is a system for gunshot detection in facilities like government buildings, schools, casinos, uh, that type of thing. They've been around for a long time and started off as a company uh, uh, working mostly in the government space, but they, they were doing like infield shotgun detection. And <clears throat> the, the space for active shooter security has grown tremendously in the last 10 years for obvious reasons. And so they have a lot of new players that have come in. And, and Shooter Detection Systems started off as a um, developer-created uh, company, so they really never approached aesthetics with much of a care. They're like, the product's good. This is what we do. That's good enough. Um, but as the field has got more flooded, um, you guys might, may have heard of another company called ShotSpotter. They're out of San Francisco. Um, they've had some negative press in the last year or two, but um, you know, a company like that, they don't ever necessarily have the same level of product, but they're spending money and they look like they really know what they're doing and that they have the expertise. So they were suffering this sort of um, a reputation hit. People were talking about them as being the dinosaur in the room and that they weren't really bringing anything new to the game. And so when we engage with, with shooter detection systems, this was sort of their original look and feel. Uh, they had a logo and an icon that was really not relevant to the company or their products anymore. Um, even when we did our um, discovery with them, uh, no one, even some of the original people from the company knew what the icon was <clears throat> or what it was supposed to represent. And I do think it was an infield antenna and I only, that's from my own digging of the company's history, but um, so the, the people in the company just kind of, eh, like they really didn't care about it. And then their product photography was horrendous. So these, you know, this is a, a shot of it at the end of the um, assembly line, which I'm not sure why you put that on your product page, unless maybe you're talking about the rigors it goes through in manufacturing. But that was like the one product shot that they had on the product page. <clears throat> it doesn't talk about or show the situation, you know, how it's mounted or used. Does it go in the ceiling? Is it mounted down by the floor? Is it up high? Like it just doesn't tell you anything. And then the website, um, regardless of all the, the tabs they had at the top, every tab that you click would come up with this graphic. Some of the verbiage on the page would be a little different, <clears throat> but it was the, all the same graphic with bullet points. And if you had gone to a trade show, you would have found, they, they would have given you this, you know, two page poll sheet and it looked exactly like this because it was exactly this. So they really didn't have a good way about talking about their products. Um, it certainly wasn't engaging. And so sales was kind of stuck in this loop of um, answering these sort of basic 101 questions about the product that really didn't need a person. Um, and so the, they, they just didn't have a lot of qualified leads and they were kind of flooded with this, you know, uh, these really rudimentary questions. So 
we went in and redeveloped their uh, brand identity. Um, and we created a, an icon here. This S is um, the two components are made up of um, two different colors and essentially represent two fields that come out of the sensor. So the sensor um, can see uh, visually infrared and it listens for um, an acoustic signature from a gunshot. And within, I think, a third of a second, it takes, like if a gunshot happens, or let's say a book is slammed on the ground or a locker is slammed, it, it, it looks at the two signals and verifies them, which is what's represented in the middle, um, whether or not it's a gunshot detection or not. And then in the abstract, the middle rectangle also represents the sensor or the unit itself. And so we kind of, we created a story behind what was within the logo or what's, what the company actually does so that they have something to kind of talk about and it represents them as a company. And so we developed, we, we developed a whole identity system for them and delivered a brand identity um, booklet that helps guide them with their aesthetics going forward in their companies so that they have a roadmap, they have something to refer to, how to use the logo in a bunch of different scenarios. Um, and the other part of this that, that was really interesting and helpful for them was that because they were not good at talking about their product, they kind of, um, in all their materials, they, they spoke about their products in a fragmented sense. So they, um, you know, there's a software and a hardware component to the system. And instead of talking about it as this cohesive system, they would talk about the software and the software does all these things. And you might end up on a different page or pull sheet to talk about the sensor itself and what it does. Um, and so, so uh, potential customers were hitting them up and saying, okay, we want to buy the sensors, but we want to you know, just couple it into the existing software we have, or vice versa. We have the software package, we just want to hook up your sensors, but that's just not how it works. So we worked with them on their, their voice and tone and their messaging and got the, the, them talking about their product as a single unit. So now it's SDS Indoor. They don't talk about, <clears throat> I think they used to call it SDS Guardian was the name of the, the, the sensors and then they call the software something else and it just it, it was disconnected so now it becomes a unified story and we were lucky enough to redesign their website um, and what we did knowing this new having this new voice and tone we were able to um, give people a peek at the technology so you know a tab to go deep on what makes the thing work and then uh, a tab that talks specifically about the product itself to help clarify and, and define these systems for people. And this alone has really helped out the sales team a lot in getting past those, those rudimentary questions. And, and they're finding they're getting better, more qualified leads because of it. <clears throat> At the same time, we developed a new icon set for them. The original icon set was just kind of something they picked off the shelf. So we we built an icon set that was um, much more directly related to the topics, the, the features we were talking about in their product. And then we took what seemed like a pretty ugly product and through photography um, made it actually feel like an expensive, nice thing to have. Um, and it really helps uh, the sales team when you're talking to government buildings that are a lot of times full of marble walls and stuff, um, you know, their biggest initial pushback is there's no way we can do these invasive installs. It's not going to happen. But now, you know, they show these box mounted versions of the product and they can, they, they can start to visualize and see how that product will be used in their space and how it might mount. And SDS was really budget conscious. Um, and so, when we approached this, you know, there's kind of two ways to shoot it. Like we can go shoot it in the wild, like actual facilities where it's installed, um, which can get really expensive with travel and moving everybody around. But we just created some sets and, and created a few scenarios so we can show them wall mounted, 
uh, box mounted. We have shots of them in the ceiling and stuff. And it gives them like a catalog of stuff they can pick and pull from for PR, or ongoing marketing materials. And it didn't cost that much money to do, actually. And then the big test for us is always like, so we have this brand style guide. That's really great. You guys gave us this roadmap or a Bible to our brand. Um, what happens with it now? And um, almost simultaneously, when we were finishing this project with them, they were engaging with a trade show um, booth company because they had a show that was coming um, quickly. And they were able to take the, the style guide, implement all the photography, all the design thinking that we had in there, and created a uh, trade show booth that we were actually pretty proud of. We had nothing to do with and we were like, okay, we've done our job. They were actually able to follow the guide and pull it off. And so the impacts for, for SDS, um, I think first and foremost is that they're now seen more as uh, being a, a technology solution in the security space instead of just a hardware security <coughs> solution. Um, and their uh, sales engagement has gone up. So um, again, back to the, they're not answering these basic questions, but they're actually talking to customers. They're more qualified leads, um, which we all know turns into better sales in the end. So people in this room might want to know, how can I make this happen? <laughs> um, and I'm not going to make a big sales uh, pitch for myself. There's, there's a lot of ways to make this happen. Um, larger companies will have uh, a lot of design talent within their own organization. Um, and, and that's part of, um, you know, one of the design trends is this cross-disciplinary dis cross um, effect that design is having, having where uh, when it's spread across the organization, you get uh, more involvement from all parts of the company. They all become engaged. And, and then that... Um, it gives everybody a little bit of ownership and responsibility to make sure that the touch points that they're involved with um, also uh, meet the bar. But you can engage with the design studio. And, um, you know, again, design being a suitcase word, there's all kinds and all shapes of design studios. Um, and so depending on your need, you might, uh, you, you would want to research and find someone that works in the specific area that you're trying to address and people that have experience um, handling your business, your type of business problems. But all of them um, will really kind of follow a similar design process. Um, and just to highlight that process quickly is it starts off with discovery. And that's all about going and learning the, everything there is to know about the client. Um, we want to know about not just their product, but we want to know about their history. We want to know what does the logo mean to you? What does it mean to customers? Um, we'll often interview stakeholders in the company. We'll interview customers. Um, but it's a deep dive into the client um, and the company themselves. And then um, we move into research. And research um, goes beyond the company and looks more of like the market vertical. So. Um, who are your competitors? How do they speak about themselves? What are the products they're offering? How do they look? What kind of colors are they using? Um, you know, we do, uh, we'll do like a logo competitive analysis and we'll put your old logo in the middle and put all your competitors around there and see, just get a vibe for like, where do you sit in the crowd? You know, do, do, do you look like you're one of the players or it, it, does it look like you're falling short? Um, Often it's pretty obvious when you put them in the lineup. Um, and then moving into design, that's where we actually take all of that research and apply it to your business goals and try to come up with solutions. And then delivery. So um, like with SDS, our, our first delivery with them was the brand style guide. And, and your basically delivery is essentially your your roadmap or what's going to guide you moving forward with that specific task or goal. Um, and then implementation. Um, and implementation is one of these things. It's not to be understated. I, I feel like companies, uh, a lot of companies will work with get to delivery and they're like, we did branding. Yes, we've got our book. And then they stick it on a shelf and never look at it again, which doesn't really help. 
Um, you have to embody the outcomes that you find through your design process. And, um, you know, the people that, that really pay attention to the implementation um, and really focus on what they learn through the design process are the most successful. Um, and, you know, it's like, I like to use SDS because they did some good things and some bad things in the end. So good thing they found a trade show company that could build a booth that turned out really beautiful for them. Uh, one slightly bad thing they've done and continue to do is we designed the website for them, but they, they wanted to hire a, a pretty cheap uh, firm to do the production. So obviously they're working within a budget they're trying to meet, and so they've cut corners along the way, and they got it done, and it looks pretty good. But then ongoing, you know, their goal was to manage it themselves within the SDS marketing team. And so now we have absolute non-designers, non-developers now managing the website. And if you visit the site today, you can see it's already starting to deteriorate. You have just things are, look broken. Design, you know, they're gray boxes and there should be nice padding around where the text is and text is jammed up against the sides. Um, in the early days, they were using a lot of fear photography so you know active shooters like you know there was a lot of like people running with guns and and you know the police force running to the rescue and early on we were like we don't, you guys don't have to talk about this stuff that way your product like the people your customers the people that are going to buy your product already know how heinous the scenarios are you don't have to paint that picture for them it's already implied um, but they're already going back to using gun toting, you know, police force kind of imagery. And, you know, it's just how it happens. But it really goes into implementation and how important it is to like stick to the rules you're sort of given if you want to, to make this stuff uh, last ongoing. So that is my presentation for today. I hope.